So the last presenter for this morning is our third and final 2B chief resident next year, and that's Reese Feist, and he's going to be speaking on oral steroids for bacterial endophthalmitis. And we also want to congratulate him because he's getting married in a month yeah. to Stephanie. <laughs> So I'll try to go pretty quick so y'all can get lunch. But, um, so my project, it, I'm a little bit bummed out. So I was going to look at oral steroids and endophthalmitis. My IRB is still under review, so I don't have any new data that we've been able to pull. Um, I'll blame Dr. Shakur for that one. Um, but he, uh, he and Dr. Vitali are the two providers that really routinely put patients on oral steroids after they've uh, gotten an, uh, in bacterial endophthalmitis. So, Kind of most of the provider, or all of the pro providers here, they'll start with a tap and inject, and then um, they'll do vancomycin, ceftazidime, and then intravitreal dexamethasone. Um, but then, kind of in, in addition to that, some of them will do oral steroids. So we're planning to do a retrospective chart review of bacterial endophthalmitis cases that we've seen here. So they don't all originate here, but we get a lot of referrals from outside as well. We're hoping to evaluate the frequency of the infections, organism type, and then the response to treatment between those given oral steroid and those without. So hopefully pretty soon we'll get that approved. But just kind of as a justification for the study, I was just going to review a little bit of the other literature first. Um, the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study looked, was looking at 420 patients with endophthalmitis after uh, primary cataract or secondary IOL placement. Um, they essentially randomized into four groups. So they did initial vitrectomy with or without antibiotics. So those were two groups. And then tap and inject with or without IV antibiotics. Um, so for the vitrectomy, they were getting 20 gauge, aiming to remove about 50% of the gel in eyes with no vitreous separation, so try to a fairly minimalistic approach. And this was followed by intravitreal uh, amikacin and vancomycin, as well as a subconj injection of vancomycin, uh, ceftaz, and dexamethasone. Um, they also put patients on topical antibiotics with vancomycin or amic and amikacin, which was used up to Q1 hour alternating if there's any evidence of a wound leak or wound infection, um, and then Q4 hours otherwise. Um, for the IV therapy, they had uh, ceftaz and amikacin. The amikacin was titrated to serum uh, concentrations. But then kind of one, one point here is that they did do oral steroids. So they were using oral prednisone 30 milligrams twice a day for between five to 10 days. Um, and their results, at, at their one year uh, point, they had 53% of patients who had actually done quite well getting 2040 vision or better. 74% um, were uh, 2100 or better. Um, their culture data, so 47% of cultures were coag, uh, coag negative, gram positive, so staph epi, those sort of things. And then 16% were other gram positive bugs. They found no benefit from IV antibiotics, um, and then they ended up recommend, recommending vitrectomy only for light perception patients. That increased the chance of achieving 2040 vision or better by, uh, by three times. So about 33% uh, of patients with light perception vision or worse that had vitrectomy ended up 2040 or better versus 11%. So after that, and starting even a little bit before that, there had been a move to kind of move away from the oral, oral steroids and towards uh, intravitreals. So kind of in the, really in the 1970s was when most of the literature uh, started coming about using intravitreal dexamethasone. Um, and uh, kind of the justification for that um, was, you know, lower, lower systemic toxicity and those sorts of things. Um, in one rabbit study with a pneumococcal endophthalmitis, uh, they, they were looking at intravitreal vancomycin levels and found that the antibiotic level was significantly higher in those eyes treated with intravitreal dexamethasone at the same time. Um, so there's been kind of varying studies just mainly in, in, in rabbits and those sorts of things looking at the outcomes with the intravitreal uh, mode of treatment. The largest uh, human study was I think about 250 patients. They, um, Unfortunately, there's no, no significant difference in the portion of patients achieving a final best corrected visual acuity of 2040 or better. Um, actually, not too long ago, they, oh, there was a Cochrane review from, um, from February of this year that was looking actually at, um, at uh, outcomes of those treated with or without uh, intravitreal steroids. So they had found um, three studies with a total of about 95 patients, uh, prospective studies. 
and they, they, all of the patients in these trials, um, for, they're European, um, were treated with intravitreal dexamethasone uh, and then a combination of two intravitreal steroids. There was a trend, a trend toward better uh, outcomes in the, the intravitreal dex patients, um, but no statistical, no statistical significant difference between the two groups. Um, in terms of just the safety of this, it does seem to be safe. Um, a dose of intravitreal dex is it's eliminated from the vitreous cavity after about two days, so it doesn't get you through the entire inflammatory stage of the infection, but it does offer you some protection. It's found to be safe at doses of 400 micrograms or, and less. Um, over that dose, it's thought that the Mueller cells are the primary site of toxicity, so similar to the, to the aminoglycosides and the response to those. Oral steroids, like I said, have fallen out of routine uh, use for uh, many providers in the treatment of endophthalmitis. And as such, there's been no studies looking at the outcomes of oral steroids on the treatment of endophthalmitis. The potential justification would be that by treating for a full course of five to 10 days, you can kind of get the patient through that entire time of the inflammatory process and not just the two days it takes to wash out. Um, but, you know, this being said, it's still, it's still fairly controversial. There was a poll in 2004 and ASRS so only about 47% of retina providers at that time were routinely using any type of antibiotic in their endophthalmitis patients, whether it was oral or intravitreal. So it's kind of people, practice patterns are all over the place. Um, kind of transitioning to that, I, we do have an interesting endophthalmitis case that I was going to present um, and kind of tags on to actually what Julie was talking about earlier with some of the kind of the scler scleral fixated IOLs. But this was a guy that kind of came in Oh, quite a while ago, he had decreased vision in his right eye. He was found to have a chronic macula off retinal detachment as well as a dislocated intraocular lens. So in January, he had a combined scleral buckle, uh, 20 gauge of vitrectomy with silicone oil, and then he had his IOL explanted and was initially left aphakic. Um, his subretinal fluid resolved, but he developed chronic macular edema following this. So he came in about 2250, uh, 2200, somewhere in that range. and. Um, kind of the best he did post-operative was about 2125. He had no response to Pred Forte and Nevinac at 10 weeks, and so he eventually underwent a combined vitrectomy with silicone oil removal, membrane peel, and then a scleral fixated IOL in April of, uh, of 2012. Um, and so he had uh, this lens implanted with an 8 Gore-Tex suture. So in July of 2012, uh, he still had persistent macular edema with count fingers vision. He started on Nevinac, um, but his macular edema persisted. So in September, Pred Forte was added to his regimen. In April, he had still had minimal improvement in the CME, despite a membrane peel, despite uh, and two agents. So he was given an Osrodex and had an, uh, a retinal anatomic success, but still poor vision. Um, but then he started getting corneal decompensation. Um, these were actually some pictures taken from that time. So there had been just these kind of little whispers in the chart of some kind of conge inflammation. And you can see these sites here. You can't see it as well nasally, but uh, really, really well out here, um, some kind of inflammation over the site of his Gore-Tex suture. And that was back in April. So his cornea started decompensating, and then he had a DSEC procedure. Um, at the time of the procedure, he was noted to have nasal and temporal areas of the exposed Gore-Tex. He underwent conjunctival res, uh, revision with 80 and 90 vicryl. Um, kind of otherwise, in the short term course, course, did require that his graft be refloated on post op day number six. Um, and then in July 2013, the Gore Tex suture again eroded through. And then just over the over the numerous visits, are just these recurrent notes of suture erosion, waxing and waning inflammation of the conjunctiva. In July, he was seen on call and uh, noted to have a microhyphema with vitreous hemorrhage on his B scan. He was seen by one of the older retina fellows at that time as well. Um, so there was concern for UGG syndrome at that time because uh, his hemorrhage eventually did clear fairly quickly. This was uh, July, so kind of similar, similar appearance temporally. Um, and then kind of just this, this whitish material over the, the nasal site. So notes kind of changed a little bit, and these were kind of eventually called Gore-Tex granulomas. Unfortunately, in January of 2015, he came into triage clinic and had four-plus AC cell and then, again, white inflammatory tissue over the sutures. He had a tap and inject at that time with uh, Vanks, Ceftaz, 
uh, and then also dexamethasone. The cultures, you know, even at two years I checked and there's still no growth for bacteria or fungus. Um, kind of given the, the clinical course they were after, this was eventually in um, some of the notes that are attributed to a graft rejection. He was treated with kind of varying modes of topical steroids, so Maxitrol, Predforte, those sort of things. In December um, of 2015, so you know, not quite a year later, he came back with, um, again, 4-plus ACD cell, white inflammatory, white inflammatory tissue over the sutures, and then was also noted, this was when Jim Bell first saw him, so noted to have severe con uh, scleral thinning over the, overlying the, or with overlying conjunctiva. He had a repeat tap and inject, again, vein, ceftaz, dax, and then they also gave him voriconazole, because uh, Jim was concerned this could have a fungal component that had just been kind of very, very mildly festering. Um, and this got kind of cut off, but his cultures again returned no growth for bacteria and fungi, and they also sent off um, vitreous sample for uh, pan PCR at the University of Washington, which also negative, negative totally negative. So these were pictures from December 2015, so you start to see, again, more kind of uh, pigmentary changes in those sites. So kind of get the suspicion for some thinning under the conj there more kind of suspicion for thinning under the conj, closer up. And then these are actually some, um, some retro, trans some uh, illuminated views. So you can see <coughs> right here how thin that is, and also kind of at the other side, just superior to that. It's not showing up super well. Thank you, Dr. Betty. Um, can't really see it quite as well up there, but there is also some uh, trans illumination defect up there superiorly. Um, and then just here's another view of it as well, so you can, can make it out a little bit better on this shot. So in February of 2015, after the inflammation settled down from the tap and inject, he went, ended up going back to the OR. He had Gore-Tex suture removal at that time. They're able to actually refixate the IOL to the iris with ninoproline suture. Um, the temporal conjunctiva was closed with amniotic membrane grafts, and then the nasal with just sliding conjunctival flap with tenons. Um, and he did initially have a wound leak, which was successfully treated with a bandaged contact. Um, the Gore-Tex suture was actually dropped into a culturette tube and then sent for culture, and finally, finally got something back. He ended up growing serratia, um, and then it was fortunately pretty almost pan-sensitive. Uh, they're not typically uh, sensitive to the uh, amoxicillin or ampicillin, but he'd been getting ceph. Uh, uh, ceftazidim, uh, which it was sensitive to, which was good. So 20, in July of 2016 was his last visit. He had stable vision overall. He'd uh, been kind of at about 2400 following this, this second procedure. Um, There's no further thinning noticed throughout these visits, um, but unfortunately in August the patient uh, was deceased. Um, so we haven't been able to follow up with him anymore since that time. So just uh, <laughs> Just kind of in terms of this, it, it was kind of interesting to me because the serratia is a rare cause of bacterial endophthalmitis, and, and some of the various studies looking at the kind of the epidemiology of these, it's it's you know probably less than one percent and at the most. Um, there was a review of ten cases which was showing all were sensitive to ceftaz, but they do horribly horribly poor with this infection. It's there was I, I think one case in there that ended up 2020, but the rest were basically like no light perception. Um, final visual acuity is 20 or 2,400 better in only four of 10 eyes, um, and four of 10 also required evisceration, just the infection was just so horrible. Um, and so scleral fixated IOLs have been reported as a risk factor for endophthalmitis based on the presence of permanent tracts going through the sclera. Um, there's been numerous reports of late failure of polypropylene suture. Um, Dr. Mamlis can talk a little bit about this too. Um, it's a monofilament, monofilament polymer of propene. It's not absorbent, but biodegradation um, has been found in highly metabolic tissues. So they recommend kind of placement far away from the limbus and other sites of kind of actively dividing cells or high blood flow. Um, Gore-Tex, on the other hand, it's a, it's a non-absorbable polytetrafluoroethylene monofilament. It's got greater tensile strength, so there's numerous kind of prospective benefits to using this over proline. Um, it's most commonly used now for heart valve and vascular procedures, so cord eye, uh, tendon eye procedures. Um, there was actually not too long ago a recent one-year follow-up of 84 scleral fixated IOLs with Gore-Tex. They had no super erosions and then low rate of other complications. Kind of the, 
Um, and they published kind of two series of these, one with just the school of fixated IOLs and then another in conjunction with vitrectomy. So kind of the, the, the outcomes were kind of similar to what you'd expect with, uh, with corneal, corneal edema, vitreous hemorrhages, those sorts of things, but uh, no other serious complications. So, Brian. Did they say in there any method of the cortex suture, like were they all buried knots or? And these, they were buried. Yeah, and in those series, they were buried. Um, I'm not sure, I, you know. Was this patient's buried? So Jim, so like I said, the, the notes were kind of uh, a little bit light on detail. Um, I but, think they were. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Jim noted some, what he yeah, calls suture yeah. tails. He's a big knot. Yeah. You, yeah. you leave it on the surface, it's going to roll. You can crush the tissue, you can crush that cortex and yeah. The other thing too is they were at nine and three, yeah. which are which are areas you want to avoid uh, putting the secondary lens in. And then didn't you say it was a ZZ nine ED? Yeah. Uh, I would be really reluctant to suture that one to the iris. Uh, but there I wouldn't rotate it yeah. that because it's, it's I mean you're, if he had lived, there's a chance of giving him a an out yeah. of it's really yeah. off. Right. So you don't you know be careful on that. Um, so just kind of in terms of the Gore-Tex, so it's, it's been awesome for most people, but just if you actually go on the website, they, they have a specific contraindication against ophthalmic surgery. Um, you know why? I'm not sure. It will. You, you can't get it approved. They don't want to do this stuff. It's been if, fantastic. If you, if you get it approved by the FDA and you haven't tested in the eye, mm -hmm. And you don't say that you can't get it approved. Yeah. So that that's I mean it, it's it's a it's a what do you call it? It's a it's a, it's a foregone conclusion yeah. that if they don't study it that way, they have to exclude it. And then you know, kind of that being said, like when you Google Gore-Tex sutures, the uh, the first thing that comes up is their website, and then right after that, scleral fixated IOL, and then an American <laughs> Academy of Ophthalmology uh, link as well. So uh, it's just a little ironic, but. Um, so that was kind of what I had, you know, hopefully next year I'll have some, some actual fresh data that we can use, but keep my fingers crossed for the IRB, so. Dr. So this, this, this would be a good m and discussion. It's, in plastic surgery, we call polyfilament sutures. Cortex is actually not a monofilament, it's a polyfilament, yes. which is macerated into a polyfilament suture, so it's a polyfilament yes. We call them granuloma sutures. Decently, but the point is very, very valid. The minute you see a granuloma at the site of the suture, whether it is a polyfilament or a monofilament, you sometimes see them with polypropylene, nylon, etc. You have to have to have to remove the suture. The minute you remove the suture, everything settles down. So, in retrospect, putting the patient on topical intravitreal, you, you're treating the surface basically. So, as a matter of principle, in plastic surgery, we didn't receive granuloma anywhere after the surgery. We just removed the suture. That thing settled down, you know, it's going to prepare things later as far as the face is concerned. Here, your, your scleral belt will have stopped. And, and we know why the scleral belt You get toxicity, you get the release of plankets, et cetera. So, so this isolated area where we have uh, some type of prosthesis that just doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I knew you were going to get a bacteria out of that. Yeah. It just, um, I had a corneal transplant that I just could not suppress inflammation. It was like that it just kept rejecting and we replaced it several times. And this was the third time around. And I just looked and I just thought it looked very strange what was happening in the capsular bag. And so I pulled the, the lens and the capsular bag and everything, just left the patient a fake to see. And is Nick here? Nick, I think we got a serratia out of that one. That was also a serratia as well. So serratia is famous. We're just sitting there and just smoldering, smoldering, sitting, and, and, and causing this chronic inflammation and difficulty. Uh, and, and until you get rid of the site of it, you, you can't eradicate it. Even though it shows it's sensitive, this is typical. Yeah. You just, you, there's no other way. So also a good thing that, that when you consider that, likely you've got that. The P. acne is another one that can fool you like this. Just sit around forever until you finally get rid of it. We had a case like that when I was lost after eye muscle surgery in an adult wow. with long-term smoldering infection. I believe it was also serratia. Right. Um, so it, it's a bad act. 
And it's, it's the, the pink and red stuff in your shower when you forget to clean it for a while. There was, there was a bad outbreak actually in Alabama when I was in med school. It got into some TPN that they had mixed up for one of the private hospitals down the road. And had a lot of people die from that one actually. So. But it, it, it's on the, the faucets. They were, they were using faucet water. So. On that cheery note, it's time for lunch. <laughs>